This job is a interesting job. There's a piece of uh, like medical grade equipment. This guy's got all kinds of crazy stuff. So every time I go out to this guy's house, there uh, there's all kinds of different weird stuff. Like he's got a cryo chamber. He does his own cryotherapy. Um, he's got a hyperbaric chamber. Um, he's got like a treadmill that has these weird lights on it. He's got an infrared sauna. Like he's just always doing crazy stuff and wanting like custom things built. So this is an infrared therapy bed. It essentially looks like a tanning bed. And for all intents and purposes, it's a very similar thing to a tanning bed. It's just not used for tanning. This bed specifically uses um, a bunch of different light spectrums and it's supposed to be for like charging your mitochondria, something about more energy in your cells. I don't know all of that jazz. What happened with it is I guess at some point it just stopped working and he went and started unplugging cords and he found that one of the, the receptacles and the cords had kind of shorted out or it had like melted together. The first thing that we had to do was completely take this thing apart. The reason why we had to do that is on the very bottom of this is where all of the electronics are. So unfortunately we had to take the whole top of this bed off. The bed was very heavy and it was very cumbersome and difficult because each one, me and my helper had to both be on one side or the other, holding this thing in place while trying to twist uh, you know, Allen wrenches and disassemble everything. So the first thing that we did was we had to disconnect the hydraulic arms and you had to hold the top at a very specific angle just to be able to get um, the joints and the balls to separate from the, the, this thing. So it took a hammer and tapping it and kind of just like adjusting it and getting it to sit right. Once we had those removed, we just had to unscrew the top. There was one screw in each side that was holding the top to the bottom of the bed. Once we got that taken out, we were able to lift the bed, flip it over. I had some moving blankets and some towels and, and jackets and stuff that we set down so that we weren't damaging this really expensive piece of equipment. We laid it down and then we could go to work on the rest of it. And then it, the, the bottom of this thing was way heavier than the top was. Like most of the weight was in the bottom of this thing. Oh my God, that's so heavy. <laughs> Can we just do it like that? The next thing that we do is we have to take out like 900 screws. There are tons of Allen head screws of multiple different sizes all over this piece of machinery. Every bracket that we took off, the whole belly pan was one kind of screw. The brackets were another kind of screw. The hinge that held the top and the bottom was a completely different screw. So my pro tip for the day. I always keep a huge bag full of Allen wrenches with me. Everywhere that I go, I just, it's one bag dedicated to only Allens. Because as an electrician, you're gonna come across all kinds of things that use Allens. I've got T-handle Allens that I will use for like large um, service panels or something where I'm putting in, you know, service entrance conductors. Um, I've got small stuff that's like L-shaped Allens. I've got Allens that are, are retractable or they, you know, fold out because some environments are tight spots and you don't have the luxury of having a long tool. It has to be something kind of short. Some things you need very specific kind of leverage, some things you don't. So there's just, I like to keep on me a whole plethora of all standard sizes and metric sizes of like four or five different types of Allen configurations. I even have Allens that go onto a socket set that are like really big, that are like, you know, three quarter, three eighths, uh, nine sixteenths, half inch, but they're on a socket so that I can put them on a drill or something and get really big torque. But keep a bag of Allens on you. Now, when we got all of the screws removed, we were able to open up the belly pan and expose all of the circuitry. So right away I could see that there were uh, some fans that were hooked up and a little bit of a fun fact. When you have electrical equipment, electricity running through conductors builds heat. That's why everything in the, the code book is based off of uh, heating. Insulations have temperature correction factors. They have uh, actual temperature ratings that you can't exceed or else they will start to melt. So anything that has anything to do with electronics and electrical, uh, electrical equipment builds up heat. So you'll, oftentimes you'll see in like a server room, um, you'll somebody will put like a fan in, some kind of exhaust fan to wick 
uh, exhaust away or they'll put cooling fans. Computers have cooling fans to kind of blow cold air or they'll have like, water cooling or something because they're trying to cool the electronics down so they don't overheat and burn up. Um, this situation is very similar. We've got a, a, a bed that is essentially a hot bed that builds up heat and uses light. It's got switching power supplies on it that build heat, the electronics build heat, the boards build heat, the conductors themselves build heat, um, somebody's body inside of this thing, you know, it's just like there's tons of heat around all of this equipment. So having cooling fans that can blow on all of the conductors as well as the boards themselves uh, is, a, is a key thing. So we remove the wiring harnesses for each one of the cooling fans and we take the belly pan and set it off to the side. Now we have access to everything in the bottom of here. So I start to look at what the problem is and we have this receptacle that's burned up. So I had to follow the receptacle back. It was attached to a cord that was a pre-manufactured cord. So we disassembled that. I just cut the cord in the receptacle because it was easier than trying to get the pins apart. And I pulled all of that out. I took a brand new cord that we were sent from the manufacturer and I fished that into the correct spot put the receptacle and the pins up to each other. And I noticed that like the cord itself with all of the conductors, each one of the conductors was labeled. There was like a one, two, three, four, five, and a six. Um, and so the, the pin out of the receptacle was the same way. I looked at that receptacle and it said one through six. So I just put all of the pins in the appropriate places where they went. Once I had all of that put together, I put heat shrink wrapping um, per the manufacturer specs, I put heat shrinking around the conductors just to give a little bit extra protection, make sure that like no dirt or dust or anything gets on the inside and that these don't get like any abrasions or anything like that. Now there's no reason for like code why you would have to heat shrink in an environment like this. It's just kind of an added layer of protection. It's not a rigorous layer of protection by any means, but most of the time when you're heat shrinking, you're either heat shrinking um, something that is rated for electrical insulation. That's not this kind of heat shrinking. Some uh, you'll, you'll come across some like crimp on connections and stuff that can be heat shrunk and they're rated for being uh, electrically insulated or it's rated to be an electrical insulator. Um, a lot of times when you heat shrink, it's just because you have a piece of equipment and the manufacturer has heat shrunk everything. So you're trying to match what the manufacturer has done. So aesthetically, a lot of things get heat shrunk. Some people do heat shrinking for moisture protection. They don't want, they, they want to give some kind of moisture barrier. Some people do it just for dust and for particulates building up, but really there's nothing in electrical code that says that we have to heat shrink all of this stuff. It's just that I'm doing it because that's what the manufacturer asked me to do. Once we had the cord in place, we put the receptacle in its spot and screwed it in place. And then we tested the brand new cords that we were sent on both ends to make sure that there were no issues, everything hooked up like it should. And then we started to put everything back together. So we had to put the belly pan back on, which means we had to clip each one of the fans back into its place and put the 900 screws in the bottom. We got all of the decorative metal pieces all the way around the outside. We've got all the electrical power supply and everything put back in place. Now it was just time to lift this heavy behemoth. So um, we flipped it up on its side, same thing, just making sure that we had padding and towels under place the whole way. We were very careful to make sure that we didn't drop uh, or break any of the glass on this. So you'll notice when I flip this thing over that I set it on my boot. Safety time. I like to wear carbon or composite toe boots, but I always, regardless if I'm working in residential construction, residential um, service work, commercial construction, commercial, like it doesn't matter to me. I wear pants and boots every single day as an electrician, always no excuses, no exceptions. There are people that I've worked with in the past that love to wear like, you know, like gym shorts and they'll wear like slip on shoes and they'll wire houses that way. I to each their own, but to me, I've seen more people drop things and hurt themselves or scratch themselves or just things happen when they have exposed skin and shoes that you can step on a nail through. Like I've just seen it so many times. So personally, I always recommend people wear pants every day and wear safety toed boots. So anyways, you see me put this machine on my foot and we scoot it over because it's so heavy. Like there was, it was either that or put it on the ground and try to drag it, but then we were gonna scratch the ground and scratch the piece of machinery. And I didn't wanna do that. So we ultimately had to just scoot this over on our boots and then start to flip it over 
and bring it down to the ground. And once we got the base of this thing flipped back over, then we lifted the top up. And this was kind of tricky, the top's really heavy, so not only did we have to flip it between the two of us, but we also had to set it down on something that was soft so that the, the two pieces of glass between the top and the bottom didn't smash each other and break. Um, so we just wanted to give some kind of insulation in between. So we had something to set it down on because we had to hold this thing with one hand at a certain angle and screw everything together with the other hand. So once we got the top and the bottom screwed back in place, then we were able to kind of move it up and down um, and reattach the hydraulic arms. It opened and shut just as it should. And at this point, I had the manufacturer on the phone because they wanted to FaceTime and make sure that the startup, everything went fine. They talked me through what the diagnostics on it, you know, uh, turning the thing on, what buttons to push to test everything. All of the lights came on just as they should. Um, there were no like strips of light out or anything, which is something that could have happened with these pins um, if we had gotten the pin out in the wrong order. But everything just turned on and it was fine. All right, so now a little bit of code for you. There's nothing in the National Electric Code that covers this environment. Um, it could be like electric space heating. It could be something because it's it's kind of heating, but it's really lighting uh, for your body. So there's nothing in here that covers this specific piece of equipment. So if we look in appliances, in definitions, in, in uh, Article 100, appliances utilization equipment generally other than industrial that is normally built in standard sizes or types and is installed or connected as a unit to perform one or more functions such as clothes, washing, air conditioning, food mixing, deep frying and so forth. So pretty much all equipment that you're gonna run across that has been manufactured, that you can bring into a building and put in place and, and utilize it is an appliance, right? It's a very, very vague thing. The only thing that really separates that uh, is anything that is motor driven. So there's a little bit different rules. We have article 430 for motors uh, motor circuits and motor controllers, but we also have 422, which is appliances, and it talks about uh, electric space heating in 424. So these are all kind of things like, wait, isn't a furnace an appliance essentially then? Maybe, well, there's a whole section in NEC for fixed electric space heating uh, that is different than appliances and is different than motors. And some appliances have motors. Some heating has uh, have motors in them as well. So it can be kind of confusing trying to figure out like where we're putting this stuff. So we're gonna do a short little example. Um, this is definitely an appliance. It's a thing that is manufactured. Lots of these are, are put together. You can buy them off of a, uh, a, a website shelf and have it delivered and plug it in. So this is what we would call a cord connected appliance. Um, so I'm gonna look through here and we'll try to figure out disconnecting means because every appliance that you put in has to have the, the ability for you to disconnect power for you know you work on the equipment. So do we have to put a manual disconnect uh, hooked up in an area for this thing. Do we, can we use the breaker if the breaker's in the same room or if the breaker's not in the same room, but it's kind of in near the area and it's like a certain footage away or anything like, how do we have to disconnect and connect this piece of equipment? Um, and do we have to? So let's look in 422. Um, we look in part one, that's just general. That's talking about like what kind of appliances and things need to be GFCI protected. Part two is about the actual installation um, of the branch circuits or the equipment that you are about to hook up to. It kind of goes specifically in part two, electric uh, space heating, open coil, um, household type surface heating elements, motor operated appliances, central heating, central vacuums. Um, but then if we look over to part three, disconnecting means. Now uh, there's a couple of different articles within here. So 422.30 is general. It says a means shall be provided to simultaneously disconnect each appliance from all ungrounded conductors in accordance with the following sections. So then it goes boom, 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 gives us some of the sections. So if we look at 422.31, which is the next logical progression that we're gonna do, we've got A, B, and C. So we need to figure out, well, do any of these apply? First of all, 422.31 says disconnection of permanently connected appliances. This isn't a permanently connected appliance. We could temporarily disconnect it. 
we could permanently disconnect it. We can plug this thing in over and over and over. So this is a different kind of thing. This isn't like permanently fixed to a wall, to a structure and is wired in place. So I'm gonna say we're gonna skip A, B, and C because this doesn't apply to us. Then we go to 422.33, disconnection of cord and plug connected or attachment fitting connected appliances. Ding, ding, this is us. So we have A, B, and C within this. Um, it says under A, separable connector or an attachment plug. That sounds like what we're doing too, or connection at the rear base of a range. We're not talking about a range, that's a piece of cooking equipment. And C is the rating. Um, and that just says what the rating should be. So we're gonna be within A. So 422.33A, separable connector or an attachment plug. It says for cord and plug or attachment fitting, connected appliances and accessible separable connector or an accessible plug or attachment fitting and receptacle combination shall be permitted to serve as the disconnecting means. The attachment fitting shall be a factory installed part of the appliance and suitable for disconnection of the appliance where the separable connector or plug or attachment fitting and receptacle combination are not accessible cord and plug connected or attachment fitting plug connection appliances shall be provided with a disconnecting means in accordance with 422.31. So basically, if you can't get to the plug, if it's like nearly impossible to get to the plug, then yes, we would need to put some kind of disconnecting means in place because the whole idea is that somebody's going to be coming to work on this thing uh, and to be able to disconnect this thing in some fashion so that people can work on it is the goal. But as you've seen with this piece of equipment, I was able to move the equipment, get to the plug, remove the plug. So that's all the disconnecting means that we have to have. If this was like a permanently connected in place appliance, could we use a circuit breaker as our disconnecting means, right? It's a switch. You can flip it and turn the machine off and you can flip it and turn the machine on. You can use breakers as disconnecting means, but there's some stipulations to it. So in section B of 422.31, it says for permanently connected appliances rated over 300 VA, the branch circuit switch or circuit breaker shall be permitted to serve as the disconnecting means where the switch or circuit breaker is located within sight from the appliance or capable of being locked in the open position. So that's two different things, right? They're saying if we were in a piece of equipment that was fastened in place like this, that either in the same room within line of sight, if I can see the disconnecting means or if I can see the, the, the panel and the breaker, it's cool. I can use that as my disconnecting means. I don't have to go install some separate disconnect for this piece of machinery. I can just run straight off the breaker, pop it right inside the unit, that's all. Um, the other thing is if it's not within line of sight, if it's like outside and around a corner, as long as the disconnecting means at some, in some way is lockable in the open position, then it doesn't matter. It doesn't have to be in the same room. That just means that I can go and put a lock on this thing and nobody's going to walk behind me and boom, like re-energize this thing and electrocute me while I'm working on the equipment. The whole idea behind all of this is keeping people safe while they're working on equipment. In this environment, the cord that we have and the receptacle that we put in to plug this piece of machinery in is the disconnecting means. And that is within part three of 422 appliances. If you want to read more about that, that was a very successful job. Uh, the only thing left th that we did is just pushed everything back in place, cleaned up the whole area and left. So a very, very easy job, but it was also a good job for me to show y'all that even I run into stuff that I've never done before and I have to figure it out on the fly and it's okay to Google things, to try to find solutions. The longer that you do this, you're going to run across problems and you're going to run into equipment that you've never seen before. You're going to be experienced, you know, like wiring houses that are 2000 square foot basic houses. And then one day you're going to get that 10,000 square foot custom home and they're going to have all kinds of crazy stuff in their bathrooms and they're going to have like, you know, steam showers and, you know, like they're going to go up from being like 125 amp service to a 1200 amp service. And you're like, what the hell do I do? So you just have to find information, find solutions, find answers to things. So it's absolutely okay on a job if you start Googling and trying to figure out, okay, what is this piece of machinery and how does it, 
How does it work? What are all of these different connections? Why is this like this? You know, it's okay to look that stuff up and it's okay to ask other people. There's forums out there. There's like my Facebook group, my discord server. Like you can constantly ask people questions. So if you ever feel like you shouldn't ask questions, you're wrong. Thank you so much for your attention. Please hit the join button, join the channel membership, get little tidbits and extras, little uh, behind the scenes footage. I ask you guys a lot of questions for episodes and get advice and things like that. Um, plus you get little badges next to your name in chat. Um, get some extra emojis in chat. Um, and you just support me, you know, you help me. For helping y'all, you help me back. It's really nice. Appreciate all of you guys, all these 480 volt members over here um, who's who are so special that they get their name on screen. <laughs> I really appreciate it. You guys, your constant, constant support of what I do. Thank you so much. Much love. Mas preach. Uh, anyways, hit the hit the join button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell. Uh, do all the things, all the social media, follow me everywhere, buy all my things. Love you crazy fuckers. Best can to use it and video.